All right, so good morning, and we are ready to start on our uh, lesson 11, Revelation part two. We have today's discussion and one more week for part two of these lovely, lovely overviews that we have been doing. And then we will be ready to dive into um, a holiday break. So we won't be back until January. When we, when we come back then, we'll begin with part three. Part three is going to be a lot of work on um, timelining and cross-referencing. We're gonna start doing a lot of digging into some of the specifics on this. Um, today's uh, time, one of the things we've come up, we've, I hope you noticed, we had a lot of subjects got brought up in this last segment. They're subjects of great interest. They're subjects that if you've never studied them, you might really want to spend some time through the holiday break going in and doing your own personal research on them. I am going to do as much as I possibly can time. You know, there's always a time restriction, but we'll see what we can do to try to get at least a few of the questions answered on it. But gosh, there's just so much in there that you really do have to do some of your own digging on it. Um, and if anyone here needs help or, or has questions, even through the holiday break, you can always call me or you can text me or you can email all. Though if you email me, I may not see the email right away. I'm not very good at checking my email. I'm sorry. But if you text me, no problem. Or you can call me and we can get together and have lunch and all we can chat through the whole thing. And that's, you know, that's always an option, too. So uh, the plan today is going to be to very quickly go back and talk about our contextual setting as we go into chapter 20. Um, one of the things I hope you noticed was how important, again, your segment divisions were to when you were looking at what you were looking at this week. And some of those really interesting little quirkinesses to this particular revelation on the whole that are necessary when you're handling the um, literary form, right? The literary form of revelation has got a mixture of things. You've got the visions themselves. You've got the interpretations from the angels, right? You've also got different kinds of scenes. You've got some parentheses. You've got some in the spirit moments. You've got the book outline, all these things. So let's just go back and do a very quick review that sets us in our, gets our mindset up for the discussion of uh, all that we're going to cover today. So first of all, book outline. What do you recall about our book outline? Where is it found? And what are the three uh, divisions for the book outline? Hopefully by now you've got this right here. Chapter one, verse 19. And what are the three segment divisions for the book that God gave to us in the text itself? What John saw? What is and the, the thing those the things that will take place after these things. Now, the things that John saw, there were two primary things, and what were they? In chapters one through three. Jesus. <laughs> Ta-da! The whole chapter one is all about Jesus and all those beautiful titles that we get to research. And we didn't dive into those a lot. Uh, I mean we did, but we really didn't. You could definitely spend more time in that if you're interested. And I think that personally, uh, the book on the whole is set uh, as far as your mindset, if you grab hold of all those titles, because those are the things that are going to really give you the comfort as you're going through the book. And when you hit some of these more frightening kind of places where it's talking about the pouring out of bowls and so forth, um, just recalling that who Jesus is and uh, the one who is, who was, who is to come, and that he's the almighty, and um, that he's the lamb, and that he's all these titles that were given to us in those, that chapter one. Those are super important. And then the second primary subject that was given to us is what in chapter one through three? The messages to the churches. All those details about who the church is and what God is calling her to and the rebukes that are given to those who might be getting wayward in the way that they're walking with the Lord. And if in fact, that, uh, as 
the need is there for a self-examination. Are you in fact in, in faith or not? So it's, a, it's an address to the church. It's as if a pastor is giving a congregational message. And in that congregation, some are saved, some are not. The message is applicable for both. Uh, depending upon which direction you need to go with it. If you're not saved, you need to come into faith. If you are saved, you need to evaluate your life and say, am I walking faithfully, right? Okay, so that's the segment one, what John saw. And then we saw the things that are, that was the church. Then the very last segment, the third one is the things that will take place after these things. After what things? The church age, the things of concerning the church. So he presents Jesus, he talks about the church time, he's, that's the things that are, and then he talks about the things that will come after that. All right, so that's the first segment, division. The second one we, we have uh, to recall is those parentheses moments, right? Do you remember what those parentheses moments do for us? Additional details, right? Um, the very first one is in uh, chapter seven, right? And how, what is the detail that's given to us in chapter seven that addresses what came previously? There you go. The question is posed, the very last verse of chapter six there in verse 17, who is able to stand is, is shouted. Uh, almost in a, in a sarcastic attitude by the men of the earth who refuse to repent. And the attitude is, huh, who can stand, right? And well, God addresses that. And he tells us of those, those who will stand. And then he says in uh, the next parentheses is given to us in chapter 10. Do you remember why there's that parentheses? That's right. Why does it interrupt us in the middle of the sounding of these trumpets? Because we're about halfway through the sixth trumpet when this chapter 10 parentheses is put in, right? Why does he put the parentheses there? Yeah, it's ahead. <laughs> right. It's coming. Don't miss it. Don't forget. Turn right at the next corner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, there's a turn, signal it. Okay, so chapter 10 is another parenthesis. It's put in there because of strategically the, the, the timing needs to be prior so that people are paying attention to what's about to come up. There's something important in that seventh trumpet. Now, the next parenthesis comes shortly after that. That's in chapter 12, and it's a long one, right? Do you remember what we titled that parenthesis? The three signs. Why did we call it the three signs? Because it's about three signs. <laughs> who are the three signs? What was the first sign? The woman. The woman who is, who is pregnant, about to give birth. And who is she? She's Israel. Okay. And the second sign? The dragon. And who is the dragon? He is Satan. And then the third sign doesn't come until the very end of, in chapter 15, which is very, very cool. It used to annoy me that there, you know, that there was this long break and then this other one was tagged at the end and I didn't even really connect it to the first two for the law until this time. How many times have I been through this? I finally went, aha, but it, it's like, why wait all the way to the end? Well, because for one thing, what it really does for us then, it actually gives us our parentheses, doesn't it? It says, these are, this is a sign and this is a sign. And then over here, here's the other sign. And in between is, is this message. So the three signs, the third sign is who? Seven angels. That's right. The seven angels who have the seven bowls or plagues that are about to be poured out upon the earth. Okay, so we have this parentheses. And in that parentheses, what kind of stuff do we get? What kind of information? Yes, it's actually, it's like giving you all the characters on the stage of this play that we're observing, right? It tells you about Israel, it tells you about Satan and what he has to do, it tells you about the, a beast and another beast, who are they by our naming? The Antichrist and the false prophet, and it talks about... Um, the reaping of the earth, right? It talks about those angels that fly in mid heaven and then the one like the son of man who reaps and then the other angels who reap. And what did they reap? And what did they do with the things that they reap? 
that's right, they're thrown into the wine, great wine press of the wrath of God. And so what is being reaped? People, the people of the earth. So in the first case, they're reaped and they're reaped by the one like the son of man. Who do you think that is? The believers on the earth at that time, right? Whoever is on the earth at the time of, of these events. The next one is the group of people who then are thrown into the wine press. Now, when does the wine press begin? When does the wine press of God begin? What's, what is the wine press concerning? What subject matter? The judgment, though, but what subject? God's what? God's wrath. <laughs> Thank you. The wrath of God. And where do we affix the wrath of God? to what portion of our unfolding of events? Is it in the seals? Is it in the trumpets? No, it's in the bowls. So when the bowls come, so we, once we start timelining this, we're gonna see a distinction between uh, the, the, certainly tribulation is tribulation, right? It's, it's hardship, it's, it's God pouring out his anger and he's trying to wake people up, right? In those, in those seals and trumpets. But finally, he hits a point where then his, his great fury comes out as he speaks to about Babylon, and he begins to pour out his wrath upon the earth, right? Okay, so that is your parentheses segments. Really important for you to get that at the tip of your tongue and in your mind. And if you can't remember that, the problem is, is then when you and I, as we're discussing things, we drop in here and we drop in there, your mind has to be able to very quickly make that movement and say, where am I? So that you properly view what you're looking at. These parentheses contain lots of information, right? Does it necessarily fit in a, in a sequential order to what you, where you are at at that point in the unfolding of the, the uh, seals and the trumpets and the bowls? No, okay, that, that's number one. And one of the parentheses that I did not get on this and I'm going to do it, I promise I'm gonna do it, are uh, one more segment or parentheses that I'd like to add in is the worship statements. There are times in the word of God when worships are dropped in, right? And what happens in moments of worship? What is that information? How do you interpret that information? Is it a sequential order of, of events? Not necessarily, right? That's the question, but you're really focusing so much on who God is. Absolutely. Yeah. Did did you also kind of notice that it draw it with that in mind, it drops that point in at the time when you might be getting a little anxious. It's almost like a reminder to you, God is sovereign. It is God Almighty who is doing these things. It is not an accident. It's not just happening. It's not at the hand of a man. It is God's doing. So even though it's really kind of horrific things that are going on, how does that help you and I as a believer as we're reading along and all of a sudden they begin to praise God and you know thank him for what he's doing and right it gives it does give you hope and it gives you a confidence that it's not chaos for no reason that there's that there is a divine orchestrator of these things and as a matter of fact every single thing that is occurring is is a fulfillment to the word of God the things that God has prophesied, which he tells us in here, which he prophesied through his prophets, right? These it almost seems like it almost puts things in creation and puts them in certain moments and in context. Yes. So, you know, this is not just, hey, uh, by the way, the, the moon just turned to blood. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. But it's okay because who did it? God. We praise God for what you have done, right? Yes. That's right. Even when he's judging. So even as he is judging Babylon or as he's judged, as, as we saw, one of our parentheses was about the, um, the parentheses just before the seventh trumpet. And, he's, and there's a pause there in chapter, at the end of that seventh trumpet before you close it out. And it's that worship moment. And it's saying, we praise you, God, for what you have done and what you are doing. And um, so, yeah, it really is a, has almost a calming effect. But the important thing for you to remember is that when you hit moments 
where it's, it's a clear indication that you're in the heavenly realm. You're in the presence of God and his holy angels. The, uh, who's present there? Do you remember? Who's present when you're in a worship moment? The 24 elders, the four living creatures, the, a myriad of angels, the voices like a myriad, a multitude of witnesses. Yes. So you've got this very specific kind of a setup. And when you see it, you should go, aha, I'm in worship. Okay. So now what do I take that information? Is the information that's in the moment of worship truthful and factual events? Yes. But can you take a moment of worship and place it on a timeline as it's stated in the worship? No. You have to you have to say, okay, these are factual events that are going to happen, but now I have to have, I have to leave that parentheses of worship and go to my timelining and saying, where, ha, where is it clearly stated in the timelining sequences that this event goes, such as we did last week with Babylon, right? Last week, we looked at 17 and 18. We looked at the judgment of Babylon. Uh, we hit another kind of segment division. And what do we call that segment division when we began in chapter 17? Do you remember in verse 10, I think it is. Go back to 17, 10. Or no, not 10, three, sorry. Yes, it's another in the spirit. So we have a third in the spirit and that the in the spirit moments do what for us? What does that help us as far as looking at things um in a literary form yeah you're either big picture or detail big picture or detail right so when we hit chapter 17 what are we we're in a detail time and when you hit details sometimes it's not always going to be in also not going to necessarily be in a sequential order correct but it could be but how do you validate it how do you validate whether or not something is given to you correctly in a sequential order? You know, it kind of comes within the concept. You have to find the book in and say, well, it's, it starts here, it ends there. It will be shown in other places within the scripture. Right. Say, well, that's a good point. Say, okay, well, I see where this thing fits in. Right. This, this is the lead in. This is the tail end. Right. Okay, so <laughs> I'll just repeat it for the listening audience. He's saying that there are other places in scripture that are going to help you to validate where to plug it in, right? Where it's going to tell you, at, at, usually in the cross reference, it'll be speaking about in that day. Now, that's not super pinpointed, but it's going to say in that day, right? Or at the, at the end of the time or at the end of the age. So it'll, it'll at least give you that. But where in the book of Revelation can we get an, a specific time for something? If it's mentioned, where, where are you going to go to get your sequential order? This, this. So now you've got one through seven of what? First, the seals, then one through seven of the trumpets, and then one through seven of the bowls. Okay, so where do you find the information that tells you sequentially where something actually goes? In those segments that are telling you first bowl, second bowl, third bowl, fourth bowl. Do you see what I'm saying? So you look for the segments in your revelation record. So that's why this, I keep saying, heck, keep this handy while you're studying and lay it out in front of you. Because even this week in your homework, you need to know where am I? What am I looking at? So that I don't get confused about, is this actually in a sequential order or not? Well, how do you know? You're going to only know if you go back to the first, second, third, fourth seal or trumpet or bowl, and then it will tell you sequentially where it, it lies. Now, later, when we get into uh, part three, we're going to start adding in additional details so that we are going to be able to do a complete timeline. We're going to find the midway point. We're going to be able to divide things in half. We're going to see where are those times, times, and half a times going to lie on a timeline. When will the 42 months happen? When will the 1,260 days be on our timeline? When are the 144,000 on the scene? When are the two prophets on the scene? When are the uh, bowls being poured out on that timeline? We're gonna begin to lay all that on a timeline in our uh, part three. The 
I think one of the astounding things to me when I've been through this every single time, it still shocks me almost, is we're in an overview. <laughs> <laughs> we're just doing the overview guys we're just setting the stage so that we get proper understanding of the literary work that we're in and i think this is where everybody fails and they end up with bad interpretations this is the the chart oh this one was uh lesson eight i gave it to you in lesson eight and it's your chart, and this is the one that has the segment divisions. Can you all see this? And Martha and Holly are blacked out, but I'm hoping they can see it. So this is that chart. So it came out of lesson eight. And if not, um, maybe, um, Kristen, would you send this out one more time? And what I would love for you to, and I have said this before, you all, I think it'd be great if you would go in and add one more segment down here on the bottom of worship 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 so that you pay attention to when you see the moments of worship because worship is another tricky one if you hit a place of worship it again is not on a timeline necessarily of a sequential order it's not giving you the sequential order or timing what it's doing is saying they're in the heavenly realm and what are they doing they're praising god for the things that he has done or is going to do and in some cases, like back in chapter 11, we saw they were praising him that he was ruling already and that he had already judged the earth. Well, he hadn't done it yet, right? Not as far as the unfolding sequence of things. We were only in the seventh bowl. So we hadn't come into the judgment, uh, uh, the pouring out of the bowls of judgment of wrath, correct? So every time you see a worship, you need to pay attention to that. So it would be great to put seg what I would call, again, parentheses moments of where you see moments that are clearly defined worship, okay? Because those would be another, another moment. And I don't know why it didn't dawn on me when I was doing it, but it was when we were in conversation and when I taught lesson eight that all of a sudden it came to me, I said, oh, I should have done that. I recognized it, but uh, apparently y'all <laughs> maybe didn't. And certainly we, it needed to be on my chart and I failed to do that. So let's get that done together. Okay. All right. So that sets us up again, that gets your mind back into knowing the order of things. So now what we want to do is we, we started last week, as I just said, in Revelation 17, verse three, and he carried me away in the spirit. So we're in the segment division of details. Um, and these are details that are going to be given to us about these different events. And chapter 17 follows chapter 16. Now, since this is details, right? Another little, uh, it, is a set, it is actually a defined segment division, by the way, that God put in. I mean, this isn't one I just noticed. It literally says in the spirit four times. These are segment divisions that are noted for us in the text. You see it very clearly. Um, but in these parentheses of in the spirit, it is either giving you the big picture or the details, correct? So we are now in the details segment, and uh, but we don't necessarily know where this goes on a timeline, right? So how did we determine where the events of 17 and 18 are occurring? What is 17 and 18 about? The judgment of the harlot. So to determine where the judgment of the harlot goes, you must go back to the sequencing of those seals, trumpets, and bowls and find out where the statement is that the harlot has been judged. Do you know where that is? Where is it clearly say, stated in the timelining passages? I'm going to call them timeline passages. I think I'll try to do it that way. Will that help you? Where in the timeline passages do you see the judgment of the harlot? Should I give you a hint? Go back to chapter 16. Yes, it is. It's in the seventh bowl. Yes, look at verse, look at verse 19. The great city was split in three parts. Who's the great city? Jerusalem. Uh, and the cities of the nations fell, correct? Babylon the great was remembered before God to do what? To give her the cup of the wine of his fierce 
wrath. So now you see the wrath of God being poured out on Babylon right here in the seventh seal. It's the only, I mean the seventh bowl, sorry. Yes, thank you for correcting. Okay, seventh bowl. So then when you go to 17, even though you're in, you've now moved from being this big picture of just sequential order. Now you've come back down into finite information. The, literally it opens saying the angel said come here and i will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters so he's, we've just been told at the at the end of chapter 16 that babylon has been judged now we're getting details about it in chapter 17 and 18 okay so now we are set up to go into chapter 19 and 20 which is today's discussion okay this is the homework you did this week. So now tell me what you see in chapter 19. What's going on? You were supposed to go through and note all of your major events that are going on in 19 and 20, correct? That was kind of fun. It was a little bit confusing, but did you find that the more you worked on it, the more you did list making and um, trying to discern where your paragraphs began and ended that you began to start crystallizing where those breaks were. Um, one of the things that was very, very helpful is when you see the word then or, or after these, these time references. So in 19, it says after these things, well, after what things? In, it says in verse one, after what things? After he discussed to him or explain, explained to him the details concerning the judgment of Babylon. Now, after that, he says, now after these things, what? What happened? Oh, we're back. So this is super important. We're now in worship, aren't we? How far does worship go in chapter 19? At least eight. And actually, I went ahead and, and included. I went all the way down into nine for sure, because then what's the first word in 10? then so now we have a time reference a new statement is being made now what what it says here is, is it speaks about worship that john is worshiping as Kristen just said right then i fell at his feet to worship him so is this actually is this actually worship or is this a statement that he was going to worship <laughs> it was a nice try <laughs> but don't do that <laughs> i love it you know that's right. That's right. You know what's really cool though? This is actually a really good doctrinal truth for you all to know about because when you're in the Old Testament, New Testament, wherever you are, but you see it a lot in the Old Testament where a, a angel, it says an angel of the Lord appeared to so and so, say to Abraham. And there is, or yeah, Abraham, that's a great one. Um, and it's and it says they the uh, Abraham wanted to, to worship that one. What happens if it's just an angel? Right here, he says, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship who? God. Worship God. So he rebukes him, says, no, I don't take that worship. I won't accept that worship. So what you can know for sure is every time that you come across at any moment in scripture where um, an angel appears, worship is given to him. And if the angel does not refuse it, guess who it is? It's a pre-incarnate uh, account of, of Christ. It's when Jesus appears in the pre-incarnate state and he, uh, uh, he accepts that worship then. So if he accepts the worship, it's, it's Jesus. And if he doesn't accept it, it's an angel, angel, right? Isn't that cool to know? It's very helpful. So this is a great doctrinal point right here. But in fact, is verse 10 worship? No, it's a statement that he wanted to worship and the angel rejected it. So where does your worship in chapter 19 cover? One to nine. Okay, so we are going to look at one to nine separately because then starting in 10 on, we have certain events, right? 10 to 21. We have other events that go on, correct? 10 to 21. So I separated them. Why did I separate them? Because the first portion is what? Worship.
So now that you know it's worship, how is that going to help us for interpreting? That's right. We're not in the, the, the definitive timelining segments of this book. Does that mean it doesn't happen in this order? Well, no. A couple of things have to happen. You have to evaluate what's being said and say, does it make sense for it to fit here or could it be somewhere else, correct? So what is the first worship that we get? It's, it's chapter 19, verses 1 to what? Uh, yeah, well, one to nine was the totality of worship. One to actually all the way down to five, right? Okay, yes. And then I heard something. Do you see the then? So now there's another one. So yes, the first one is an and, and it's just, it's a conjunction which contains it to the first segment. Do you, are you catching it? So let me read it to you. After these things, I heard something like the sound of a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous for he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immoralities and he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her and a second time they said hallelujah her smoke rises up forever and ever and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped god who sits on the throne saying amen hallelujah and a voice came from the throne saying give praise to our god all you his bond servants who fear him, the small and the great. Do you see how that closes out? Then it starts in verse six. And then I heard something like the voice of what? A great multitude. Does that sound familiar? That was said, it's almost a repeat of what's set up in verse one, right? So now you know you're in a second worship mo moment because why has our subject matter changed? What was the subject matter of the first five verses? about Babylon. They're praising God for the fact that he has judged Babylon, correct? Then starting in six, there you go. Yes. Yes. So this takes you back to the fifth seal where they ask that question, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? Here the statement is say, he's saying it has, a, it has been done and they're praising him for it. Now, with worship, this statement could have been all the way back in chapter one for Pete's sake, if we wanted, right? I mean, it wouldn't make logical sense to put it back there, but I'm saying it's a statement of worship because it's a statement of fact. In worship, sometimes they say, thank you, God, for something that hasn't happened yet. But in this case, where are we in the timelining of things in this book? Have we had a sequential timeline statement that the Babylon has been judged? Yes. So we know this is past tense because it's already occurred in chapter uh, 16 in the seventh bowl, correct? So the first segment here, one through five, he's praising God for something that is finished. It is done. So we do know where it goes on a timeline. So uh, how did you title one through five as far as a title for that segment? Okay, very good. Uh, I'm going to use the word rejoice because that's what they, it's rejoicing in worship, but it's the same thing. Praise. That would be your word, right? Praise. I don't think that's in the text though. Is it praise? I don't think so either. Okay. Now that's another one of those disciplines. We try to use yeah. the words from, it's so easy to slip into our own phraseology and I do it too sometimes. And I always have to catch myself or you guys have to catch me doing it. But in verse five, and uh, give praise to our God. Okay, that says give praise. I, I guess it could work. Yes. But it, hallelujah would be good. I like that. That is, that is a key repeated word in here, isn't it? Hallelujah is used three times. Okay. So rejoicing and worship because why? Yeah. God's judgment. of the great harlot. Verse 20. 
the voice over for your old heaven, and you thank the apostles and prophets which have died and have come out. What what verse are you? Yes, in 18, where the details are given to us. That's correct. Because we're in the segment of the details right now, right? We're in the, in the spirit of details. We're not in the timeline in 18. But yes, it does make that same statement. Yeah, you could, yeah, you can follow, you can go back and see that what 18, 17 and 18 do for us is it gives us the details about what that judging was about. Who did it? How did it happen? Who was involved in it? Um, but it doesn't give us the timeline. Where do we get the timeline? The timeline is back in chapter 16, where all it says is he did it. <laughs> no details, just he did it. <laughs> right, right. That's exactly right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. So yes, there's a contrast that's given to us of what's going on on the earth and the kings of the earth, the ship masters, the, all those other people who are of the earth, meaning not saints. They are, they are weeping. It says repeatedly, they weep, they weep, they weep, right? But, in, but then there's a command given at the closing statement. It says, it says to her in verse 20 of chapter 18, rejoice over her, O heavens, and it's an apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. So yes, the details on that was what we covered last week. So now we see here in 19, interesting don't you think if you think about it and, and hopefully what we're talking about right now is is giving you more clarity because we went from uh the timeline sequence in chapter 16 where he says it happens here in the seventh bowl then we go to an in the spirit moment which is is a parenthesis filled with lots of information the very first part of it is all about babylon and this happened this happened this happened this is how this is where this is who this is all those details then we move to chapter 19 and again the first thing that ha happens here is what worship so we're in another kind of a parenthesis within our parentheses aren't we so now, because otherwise, if you don't really recognize these little moments like this, like the word, it's like, why did we just go through 17 and 18? And now we're going through it again in 19, the first five verses, right? But if what you're recognizing is before it was giving you the details, now it's saying what's going on in the heavenly realm. In the heavenly realm, the, there is worship that is taking place for this account that has now happened. Okay. And we know it's happened because of in the timeline of things, the timelining is the seventh bowl. And it was given to us in 16. What verse was that? Seven. No, don't. I don't want the, it is done. I want where her name is given. Is it 19? Yes, 19. 1619, Babylon. Uh, and wrath was given to her right? Babylon's wrath was poured out on her. So here we have a statement of the wrath of God in, in that first part portion right there. So that's the timelining. This is worship in 19. Back in 17 and 18 were details. Are you seeing it though? Details. Now they're rejoicing and this back here gave us the timeline. Yep. So that you can see now there are basically three literary things that you had to, in your head, dance with in order to get a proper understanding of what you're looking at. Otherwise, you're looking at the first part of 19 and it's like, um, why are we back to Babylon in the first few verses of 19? If it was part of 17 and 18, why wasn't it just back there? Yes, they do. Where they cut to a different scene. Yes. At the same time, and you're seeing different. Or they go back in history when right. somebody was a kid. <laughs> you don't even recognize them. <laughs> yes. I recognize you're right. I mean, I'm just reading it. There's like, you know, sequentially things. 
Where am I? What's going on? This is why people get so confused. But this is so cool, guys. This is just like, this is like the key that unlocks everything. This literary form that we're figuring out here as we move through it. If, if you could, if we could only get here first, I wish I had known this when I first studied this, I would have had a lot of this put to bed in my head. There was a, there are a lot of little, little points along the way that have been so confusing to me because I wasn't looking at as carefully the literary forms that are being used in here. And he does move around in his literary forms in the book of Revelation. Hi ladies, I'm so glad to see you today. Okay, so, all right, so we've got 17 and 18, that's details. It's, we are again in the spirit. So keep that in mind. That's an, all of this is in, in the spirit, a segment division about details. In 19, one to five, now they're rejoicing about those things that happened in those details. So this is worship. The first thing they worship God for is that he has judged the great harlot who is who? Babylon. Okay. What is the second thing they worshiped God for? In the judging of Babylon, what did he also do? That's right. He avenged the, the blood of bond servants. And that goes back to the fifth seal. Uh, that's a six, nine, 610, I think it is, right? 610. Go, somebody flip open to 610 and see if we're, we're in the right spot. The fifth seal, six, yes. Fifth seal, 610. Okay, so this part here in this worship moment addresses the question that was given to us back in the fifth seal pretty cool all right all right so that takes care of that for are, are you good Is, are there any other questions about one through five the title of it has to do with first of all make sure you're paying attention this is worship okay set it off as a parenthesis for yourself i like to just put a blue puffy cloud around anything that's worship and give myself a little music note in my, it, to catch my eye so that I see that this is worship time. Okay, six through nine, again, worship, but a new subject, correct? Because he starts out with the word then, so put a clock on that. And six through nine is covering what subject matter? The marriage of the lamb. So we're at 19, uh, six, yeah, six to nine. And this is, uh, again, rejoicing. Okay, so it's worship. Again, it just is continued worship. And it's for, it's thanking God for, um, yep, rejoicing. The, now, it's very interesting. Don't switch the word to time because it doesn't say time. It says come. It has come. Okay. The marriage of the lamb, the marriage uh -huh, of the lamb. Has come. Yes. And, um, and then there's a second subject matter that they bring up in here. That's actually another event. But it's an event that how closely related to it is it to the marriage of the lamb? It's the marriage supper. The marriage supper. Number two, they're also rejoicing and they're saying about those who are invited, what? Blessed. They're blessed. Yeah, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. So again, it's a form of worshiping God there and they're saying how that they are blessed. So uh, Blessed are those invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. Okay, so those are the two subject matters. That's in verse nine. 
there. Uh, this one, uh, marriage has come, that statement is in seven. Okay. All right, so seven and nine. All right, now, this is a very interesting subject, and we haven't got a ton of time in a lot of detail to give on this, but we can do a few things. One of the things is, did anybody do any word studies uh, in this realm about the fact that it has come, that the marriage has come? Do we know at this moment where this marriage supper has occurred? Is, are we in a timeline segment? No. All we know is they're praising God that the marriage has come, right? So what we have to determine is where on a timeline this occurs, correct? Have you seen anywhere in the seals, the trumpets, or the bowls, the mentioning of the marriage of the bride to the lamb? Have we? Nope. Nope, we have not. Good. So everybody's going, oh, <laughs> it's because it's not there. <laughs> so because it's not there, so we don't have it anywhere in a place that's a timelining reference, and we're in a place of worship, what do we have to conclude about where it goes on a timeline then? Not for sure. Now, there's a few clues, however, right? Who is the the this bride who is she it's the church now um when we get when we are going through the um the seals the trumpets and the bowls when do we see the bride with jesus who is her groom when do we see that When he comes back, now we're going to hit that in this next part as far as details are given to us, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, when does, and when, it, when we look at those details, it almost might be better for us to merge the two conversations. So we're going to try to not blend them too much. But when you look at what Jesus is doing, he says about, about the one that comes with him in verse 14, what? We're called what there? Instead of brides, what are we called? armies it's the armies which are in heaven and how are we clothed clothed in fine linen and and we are doing what following. following him on white horses so he's coming back and what is he coming back to do verse 11 to judge and wage war so he's coming back to a war where did we determine jesus comes back in the unfolding of the the seals the trumpets and the bowls when does jesus come back for this war in the which bowl the seventh bowl has to be why because what happened in the sixth bowl what happened in the sixth bowl go back to chapter 16 with me uh start let's start in yeah, so, so in the sixth bowl, it says the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates. It's dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out into the kings of the whole world to gather them together for what? For war. For the great day of what? God the Almighty. This is speaking of what? When God is pouring out his wrath through, the, through a war that, that is being prepared for here in the, in the sixth bowl. Then he says, behold, I am coming like a thief. So that little statement there tells us that he's not there yet, but that he's coming and they are preparing for this war, correct? In the sixth bowl. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes that he will not walk around naked and men will not see his shame. Now, this is a parenthesis, meaning it wasn't in the original text. Somewhere it got put in along the way. It was probably rabbinical interpretation, giving it clarity. OK, but then in verse 16, it says, and they gathered them together to the place, which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddo. Now gathered them are they warring yet no but if they're gathering for war when do you think the war occurs 
has to be in the next bowl. L the logic is we're heading to the seventh bowl for the war. Sixth bowl preparation, seventh bowl war. When Jesus comes back, who comes with him? His army, and how are they dressed? In fine linen. What does chapter uh, 19 tell us about this bride? She's dressed in brought in. So what does this tell you about the placement of this wedding? It has to be, well, no, before the war, because we're already dressed in that fine linen and we're coming with him at the seventh bowl. I mean, at, yes, at the seventh bowl, right? So if we're already with Jesus, when he comes back to this earth for the seventh bowl, we're already dressed in that fine linen that he's speaking of there. It has to be sometime before the seventh bolt. Now, where we don't have the timeline on, right? It's not stated anywhere in our Revelation text. This is that infamous statement. Nobody knows the day nor the hour, right? So we have to kind of try to figure out where we theologically land in this, what our doctrines help us to come to a conclusion on. Um, I know I've already said it before, so it's not a big mystery. I believe in a pre- trib rapture for the church and when we are raptured up the rapture itself is that first corinthians 15 moment when we when what is mortal becomes immortal we become clothed in our new bodies and at that moment we are now caught up to be with who forever with jesus forever and we're going to cover this in part two when we look at our thessalonians passage we're hopefully going to be looking at first corinthians 15 as well because that's the resurrection chapter those two merge together to give you the whole picture on that but it isn't there is no definitive place on the timeline that tells us when the church is raptured it has to all be by your own conclusion of the things that you've looked at and studied and the what logic you come up with concerning it um, there are there are arguments on all kinds of sides for where they think it is but you know at, that's exactly right it's absolutely done before the seventh bowl yeah, so it's not at the at the end of the revel. There are some people who say it's after the rev after this, because of the placement of this. See in verse nine in chapter nineteen, they say, "Oh, the bowls are all done. Now it happens." No, because this is what what's going on here, worship, and since we're at a moment of worship, it's a statement of fact. It's happened, but it doesn't say when. Okay, but I do think it's helpful to come to the conclusion it's at least before the seventh bowl. Okay, so that takes us to the other two possibilities. And I don't know if you guys have done any reading or research on this, but I, I just printed out one sheet on this. There's post millennialism, all millennialism, pre millennialism, there's pre trib, there's mid trib, there's post trib uh, uh, interpretations of when is the rapture. Right. When, when does this occur? Um, and do you believe in a literal millennial reign or do you not believe in a literal millennial reign? Is it actually a thousand years or is that figurative? It's just it, the arguments are endless. But what I'm saying to you is by the time we are done with all the we're only in the overview. Right. But by the time we are done, you're going to have some pretty hard set decisions for yourself. But with all that said, the bottom line is God has the plan. God knows exactly the timing of it. What is the requirement on our part concerning receiving the blessedness of it or the curse of it? What's the determining factor? What determines whether, yeah, whether or not you put your faith in Jesus or not? Very good, Diane. Yes. If you put your faith in Jesus and you believe that God is going to do these things, even if you don't know the exact timing of them, this Jesus himself said, you're not going to know the day nor the hour. Only the father knows this, meaning that in his physical human form, he came as a servant and he's simply showing us and demonstrating to us the obedience to God, the father. And that is what we are to follow is his obedience. And 
trust and faith. We know that God has a plan and it's a good plan for us, right? So whether we know exactly where this, this wedding occurs for sure, uh, it, it probably really is not that necessary for us. I think I have decided where I want to place it on my timeline, right? But I do know this, it's before the seventh bowl. That's exactly right, especially with unbelievers, but yes, or with your brothers who are weaker. And in the case of things like this subject matter, the people who are weaker are those who have not done what we've done. Because it doesn't matter how much you study, even after we've done all this, there'll be some of us will land in different places. You know, but it, 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 that isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is to realize it's going to happen. There's going to be a wedding. It is called the marriage of the, of the lamb, and it's our marriage to him. Now, let's talk about that part of it. What, what is that talking about? Did anybody look to re, or do any research about marriage, uh, the, the Jewish tradition of marriage, and what all those? Okay, well, I will send you a link. Please remind me. Make yourself a note. Um, I have this link. This one was pretty good. It's called Faith, Faith Equip. It's Jewish Wedding Traditions. What they do is they go through and they give you all the different steps that we now know. That I know that I have a video on this also. So if anybody wants to get together with me, we can do coffee at my house and watch a video. And okay, yeah, call, call me and come on over during the holiday break. We'll do that. Um, but the video takes you through what a wedding was like in the days of Christ and particularly in the Galilean area, which they hadn't had a lot of history on it before. So apparently they found some things when they did some archaeological finds on it. Now they've clarified certain things. Well, here's this one is interesting. Starts out with an arrangement, right? Marriages then were arranged. It could be from a very early age even, right? But once the arrangement was made, there was a contract that was that was agreed upon and it was a legally binding contract. And the only way to get out of it, even though the marriage at this point when it was arranged would not yet be consummated. There would not be the union of the, the couple yet, but there would be a contract that he was going to marry her. And then she would wait where? In the home of her family. And she would prepare for the day when she would meet her husband. So it was an arranged arrangement time. So she, the arrangement is made. She would do, be doing hers. And then Jesus actually tells us as a passage in Matthew, it says, and I, and I go now to, uh, uh, to, uh, but go ahead. Tell me. Okay. Do you, do you want to tell the rest of the story? Yes. There you go. I go to a place to prepare for you. And this is, and I will sin for you and I will bring you to my father's house. Right? So that is exactly what they did in the, in their wedding traditions in, in the Jewish system, they would arrange the marriage. There would be a period of, of waiting while the bride was waiting. She was preparing herself by doing the kinds of things that a woman would do, getting her hope chest built, right? Making her garments for her clothing, uh, buying, um, items that would equip her home and that kind of thing. So that that's the, the first one is the arrangement. The second part is the preparation. Then there's the fetching of the bride. Now the, the groom comes back. He, he, in the middle of the night and an hour, she does not know. And the only one that knows that hour is guess who? The father, the father of the bride. Now this is by their tradition. He would say to the son, now it's time, son, go get her. But until daddy said to his son, go get her, do you notice how we, in the scriptures that we've looked at so far, like the, that parentheses where you see the angels and they say to the son of man who's about to reap, reap. Ah, the father now says, go get her. Isn't that interesting? So I know it's very exciting. Um, okay, so he, he, he fetches, huh? No, it really doesn't because that's in a parentheses moment again. Yeah, yeah, because that's in chapter 14, which is that 12 to 15 parentheses. Yeah, I know. Bummer, huh? 
I know it. He keeps saying that. <laughs> I know. That's right. And that and so sometimes when we get into 14 too and we see the Son of Man waiting to be told to reap, and they're like, Well, it can't be Jesus because the angel's telling him to do it. Yeah, because he's conveying from the Father, it's time. And that was exactly what was the tradition of the of the marriage in the Jewish system. The father would tell the son, now it's time, son, you can go get her. And so he goes to get, he goes and receives the fetching the bride, it's called here. Then there's a marriage ceremony. Um, once the ceremony is finished, do you know how long that that feasting takes place for? Seven days. Hmm. Seven days. Or do we have anything that might possibly correlate to the seven days? How about the seven years of the time of the tribulation? If that's true, and we're just talking, right? When would the wedding be? Before those seven years or at the beginning of those seven years, because we would be fetched to the father to, to join him for the, for the ceremony. We would be clothed in the garments that we had been, have been prepared for her. And in the text that we are looking at here, what is it that is those wedding garments? What does it say to us in, in the passage? I don't have mine open, read it for me. Fine linen, which is the righteous acts of the saints. So don't let me forget to talk about that. What is that talking about, right? Obviously, that is not our salvation. That's something beyond that, because this is now when he has fetched us, we're already in faith and he takes us to himself, right? Correct. All right. So we talk about what is that? What are those things? Well, it's the fine. It's the righteous acts of the saints. And so we have to talk about that. But once we get there, we get them, we get married or we are closed first. We, then we get married. Then we have a seven day feast wedding feast right for the of the bride and in conclusion as the bridegroom christ shows the unfathomable depths of his love for his bride by dying for her on the cross he has betrothed her and she is being sanctified right now by the washing of the water of the word at the moment the church is still called the bride of christ but soon the marriage ceremony see we are right now the betrothed of god we're not married to him yet we're just engaged we're waiting for us to be called to heaven for that day when we will marry him, but in the presence of whom? The father. At the word of the father. So that's just a little bit. I'll send you this article and then you can do your own Googling and research on this as well. Okay. But it, it was a good article. I thought it was very helpful. Okay. And it simplified it because it really broke it down into part one, part two, part three, you know, the steps, so to speak. But what's really cool is now they have found um, uh, archaeological backing to understand this is the order. And guess what? It fits perfectly. The scriptures <laughs> on how it's going to happen for us. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. God's word proven true again. <laughs> okay. So that is now the marriage supper. So uh, the, the next thing we want to talk about, so can you see how many subjects come up in this? This is like complex. Um, we want to talk about um, what it is that we're being, what are the, the righteous acts of the saints, correct? Let's see, let's see how it says in here. Um, the bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints now my first thought when i looked at this was okay the only righteousness that we have is the righteousness given to us right but this it, to me is not speaking of that moment of righteousness because this is when we're caught up and clothed and, and wet you aren't going to be caught up if you aren't already in the righteousness of faith so it's not talking about the righteousness of faith. I did put the scriptures in there for you, though, on my chart. Romans chapter four and five talks about how you how righteousness is imputed to us is by the blood of Christ and our faith in him. Right. I did put it on in my notes for you just for clarification for those who need to understand that part of it. I don't think any of you do, but uh, that part is a given. It's a done deal. That was the betrothal. 
right? Now it says it's defined by acts of the saints in this text. So what do you think that those acts of faith might be? What is that referring to? Okay. Yes. There you go. You actually quoted my verse verbatim. Oh, no. Imagine that. <laughs> I guess I'm the only one who's ever read it. it wasn't just me. Right? <laughs> okay, so it has to do with the faith that's worked out in fear and trembling. It's the righteous acts of the saints. Now, this occurs in a cup. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now there's the now that's the righteous deeds of salvation, and that's the moment of, of Abraham's salvation, which is very interesting, by the way. That doesn't happen until Genesis 15. Genesis 12, he was called out of the land of the Chaldeans and he obeyed God. So a period of years he was walking with God in faith, but in Genesis 15, God cut covenant with him. And in that moment, it says it was imputed to him as righteousness. The New Testament, Galatians 3, tells us that was his day of salvation. Isn't that cool? All right. So here, no, what we're looking at then are the deeds of the righteous one in faith. So we know that we don't work for our salvation, right? Salvation is a gift of God. It's by grace. But once in faith, we are expected to live up to the covenant of relationship with God that that he desires for us and he literally says he places his spirit within us and causes us to walk in his in his statutes and his uh commandments so he gives us the ability to do it by giving us his holy spirit and then as we walk in them then what has he promised us if we will walk in obedience to him what does he promise to give us one day you're going to receive what crowns rewards right look at how many texts in the new testament where jesus talks about coming and rewarding how about the the minus the the parable of the minus and he's going to give certain ones more than others because why why will some people get more than others they were more faithful in the thing and and let me tell you something it's not about what you're doing because it's not that at all it's about what god has given you to do how faithful were you in that if your calling by god is to simply be on your knees in prayer for your brethren and you do that faithfully your reward is as great as a billy graham right that it is not what you're doing it's how faithful you are in what it is that god has given you to do so yes Some people barely make it through yes where does that come from and where do you does anybody know where that comes from that that you'll barely get through yes yes first corinthians chapter three so i've given you these verses um uh first corinthians three second corinthians five uh one to ten second timothy four six to eight we're not going to go into detail on them because it takes too much time but those are great and that's a whole nother can you see how many subjects there are just in this rejoicing about the marriage we you know so go and look those up i also gave you some links on here where you can look up the jewish uh wedding system also the bema seat of christ that's what it's called by the way we're judged also but we're not judged for salvation where our works are judged and it says if your works were done in faith and they honor god they come through refined as silver and gold right precious stones but if they do not honor god if the things you did in your in the deeds of your flesh as believers if the things that you did are not honoring to god what happens to them because of the blood by the way did you know that they burn up because of the blood. You're forgiven for them and they're burned up and God remembers them no more. But you don't get a reward. You did it for all the wrong reasons or they weren't even God honoring. You know, you can't go and you can't go kill someone and say you did it in the name of God because murder is murder. <laughs> Pardon? So burning them up is a purifying thing. It is. It's, it's true that Jonathan was still a part of you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I used to look at that burning up part as like hell kind of a thing almost. Like, no, it's a, it's a purifying work of God. It, the fire consumes all the things that were impure that you did that were dishonoring in some way or form or fashion, either through motives or the actions themselves. They are burned up because in Christ, your sins are forgiven. But what comes through refined and shiny and beautiful, those are will be for you for your crowns. And these are the... These are the righteous acts of the saints that you then wear as a wedding gown. Kay Arthur did a beautiful thing on this, and I don't know if she's still on her videos now or not, but I remember it used to be how, about, you know, what do you, when you get married, when you grow up and you get married, what kind of a wedding gown do you want to have? Do you want a very simple, plain shift dress? You know, probably like my wedding gown when I got married, just a simple, plain dress or do you want something that's beautiful and flowing with a long trailing you know and she used to say I want mine to be so big I walk into a room and there's hardly room for me those are the righteous acts of the saints that she will be re rewarded for that individual and she said it's not about glorying in yourself but it's about how much glory are you going to give to God the father is your life glorifying to God and that's what we're working for. We're not working for our salvation. We are working to honor God in our relationship with him. So it's all about giving him glory. Isn't that beautiful? Right. 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 Yes. Right. Yes. Right. You're already saved by my blood, but what, what's the outcome of your Right, knowledge? right. So when you're, when you're going through the New Testament uh, scriptures and you're looking at those three verb tenses of salvation, there's justification, that's when you get saved. And then there's sanctification, that's the working out of your faith. That's what we're talking about here. Sanctification being rewarded. And then the last one is glorification. That's when you get to put that beautiful gown on those righteous clothes, that fine linen that's beautiful and white. Isn't that exciting? So, but you have to live this life, uh, appropriately um, honor God. He catches you up. First, he clothes you. So what does that tell you has to happen before the wedding? How are you going to get that wedding gown on? You have to go through the fire. The Bema seed of Christ must occur first so that your works can be rewarded. Then the wedding, because then you are clothed and you go through the wedding ceremony. Yeah, the, the Bema, and I call it judgment, but it's, let's call it the Bema seed. The Bema seed of Christ, because the Bema seed, it, judgment is really kind of a bad word in English. There's a judgment for the unsaved at the end of the age. We're going to get to that in a second. But this, this judgment is not judgment for salvation. This is, this is a purifying, as you said earlier, it's a purifying of those things which are dead and they don't glorify God and they get burned up. And we come out of it clothed in this beautiful fine linen. And at the end in chapter 16 in the seventh bowl, we come back already dressed in that on, white horse, on our white horse following Jesus. So this occurrence has already happened before that seventh bowl. Okay, I oh, know. Well, that's okay. The next couple of ones will be quicker. I, I know, I always say this every week. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so are we good? Everyone okay with where we're at so far? Yes? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, okay. So these were the first two. Lots of details of studies. There's like at least three or maybe four subjects here that you could do additional research on. I don't know that we're going to cover a lot of this information later. So just so you know that, take your holiday season time and use it to research anything that you're fuzzy on still. Okay. There will be some clues on my chart that I'll send out to you. You can use that as a starting place. Go online, Google, and, and then open the Word of God. And also use keywords in your concordance, your exhaustive concordance. Look those words up like Bema or Judgment Seat or whatever. And find all the places where the references are given to you. and Do, do your own study. B-E-M-A. Yes. 
um, judgment. <laughs> It's a judgment seat. A Bema seat is found in the city of Corinth. There's actually a Bema seat there today. Uh, there's actually several of them in different places, but in, in Greece, um, in particular at Corinth, the Bema seat there is where Paul was brought to. And I've been to that Bema seat. That's really interesting. And it really brought it more to life. It's the, the idea of giving an account. Uh, evaluation. evaluation. Like yeah. It just sounds like you're going to get in trouble, doesn't it? But in this case, it's a good judgment. It's the kind of judgment that, that brings you out purified and refined. And rewarded. And rewarded. Yeah. Which is what clothes you. Isn't that cool? All right. All right. So now let's go into the next section. This part will be a little quicker because they're, they're much more clear cut. Um, so now we start in 10. He wants to fall down. Uh, John does. He wants to fall down and worship this angel that's told him all these things. He's so excited. He can't contain himself. He wants to worship. And the angel says to him, don't worship me, worship God, right? So he rejects that worship. Let, make sure that John understands you do not worship angels. That's a big no-no. Angels are fellow servants along with us to God the Father. And so he rejects that. Then you see it begins in uh, 11 and conjunction. See that word and circle it, highlight it. And I saw heaven opened. Now, this is very interesting phrase when it says and I saw heaven opened. What do you now know as far as position? You were aware in heaven, right? Where are you now? You got to be on earth because now he says he's looking and he sees heaven opened, right? So you've transported, <laughs> you're into a new segment. We're now left the word. Do you see why I now separated these two? This was in the heavenly realm, these first nine verses. Now we've moved to the earthly in the starting in 19, 10, uh, 10 and 11. So in 11, he says, um, okay, 11 to what verse? Where's the next then on your observation worksheet? 17. So it takes you down to verse 16. So uh, 11 to 16 is what? I put, I added 10 in there, even though it's an odd man out verse, but anyway. Okay. Yes. And it's about Jesus. And what is Jesus doing? He comes and he comes to do what? To judge and wage war. Now, when does the war happen? The seventh bowl then, correct? So we already have that. That's in 16. Um, give me the verse again. 1610. Sixteen ten. Okay, so now Jesus comes, he wages war, and the second part of that is what, who comes with him? The armies, and this is clothed in fine linen, they follow him. Now, that's an interesting phrase, follow him. Why would it say follow him? What, what does that convey to you? He's leading the charge and we are behind him. So he is the force in this war. We are simply coming behind him, correct? Okay, and what does it tell us about what he does? What will he do in that time? Yes, very good. Two, two major points. He will first strike down the nations. And if you go back to chapter... Um, 16 and look at that verse 19 again it says and the great city was split in three parts and what happened and the nations fell do you see there there's another confirmation that you're in the seventh bowl he says he's going to strike down the nations and then what is he going to follow it with his ruling so he, this just tell you he's going to come he's going to strike down the nations And then in between, he's going to rule. 
So now he's he's now coming to be king of kings. And that was in 1619, where you see the nations are being struck down in that sixth bowl. Again, the seventh bowl, rather. Sorry. Okay. So that's Jesus. He comes with. Uh, and so this is what battle? What's the name of this battle, according to 16? Harmageddon. This is the battle of Harmageddon in that seventh bowl. Okay. Any other? Yes, it is a physical location in Israel. That's correct. But the rule of Christ begins after that. Right. That correct. The seventh bowl has to be completed. The war is finished. Then he begins his rule. Yes. Yes. Then it says, and then he rules. At, uh, I, I can add after if, you, if that's helpful. It doesn't actually say after. No, it doesn't. That's why I put it in parentheses, because you're just making a point. You have to use your logic in some of this, right? You have to use your follow-on thoughts on this. Um, yeah. You are such a feminine. And the poor guys. Yeah, and the guys are going, I don't want to wear a wedding gown. <laughs> okay, well, what, what connects the two is what they're wearing. And what follows in 20, which we're going to get to in a second, because you, if you add the wearing white, the wearing white, and then 20, what happens to the one wearing white that's following him? And we'll get to that one next okay so let's so this is the first one in 10 to 16 jesus comes right he comes for war this is the seventh bowl we know that because of a timeline reference that's given to us in uh, uh 16 um i'm going to say 10 to 19 because it really covers the sixth bowl to set up the seventh bowl is the war itself okay yeah Right, right. Yes, very good. And so he comes. You know, I never thought about that, but that's a really, first of all, I've always only kind of considered that to be because he's righteous, right? But he's also coming as the groom and he's still dressed in his wedding attire. I never thought of that. Did anybody else think of that? Yes. Yes, he is. In that symbolic picture, for sure, it's speaking of his righteousness. He's the righteous ruler or judge in that case. He's about to judge. Mm -hmm. He might be, but it's very interesting that in the context of the flow of this book that he's wearing. How could a man be like, we picture this woman's dress, but it doesn't say that. Yeah, just think of Jesus where it says king of kings and he's got a sword. Yeah, sure they did. But I would also say this in, in armies, they wear uniforms. Right. And so, you know, whether it's the general at the front or the private at the, at the rear, yeah. they wear the uniform yep. of that army. Yep. And maybe the uniform of that army is it's white linen clothes. because it has to be. You have to be dressed in the white, the righteousness of Christ. Absolutely. Okay, let's move on. 17 to uh, the to the end. Well, actually, 17. Oh, gosh, how did I do this? I'm going to break it down. Um, 17 and 18. What is the next event? The Great Supper. The Great Supper. So 19, 17 and 18 is the Great Supper of what? Of God. And in this case, what does that supper entail? The birds. And what are they eating? The flesh of men. What men? <laughs> yeah, there you go. So the men, and when you go back to 16, at the end, it says, um, 
speaking of God giving out her cup of wine, then you go on to 20 and every island fled away. The mountains were not found. 21, the huge hailstones, about 100,000 each, came down from heaven upon men. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. So there you see the men on the earth being also decimated by the things that God is pouring out in regards to these hailstones. Um, all right. It is. It is a cleanup. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, actually, not not quite. But for a thousand years, it's finished. That's right. For a thousand years, it's a done deal because Jesus is going to come, and we're going to see now that how long is he coming for, and what will he be doing, right? Okay, so we see the birds come. There's this great supper of God. So this is going to be where, as far as you can tell, when does this occur, the great supper? We can't determine it. Although it looks to me like in the sequence of the giving of this, first is the war and then is the follow-up supper for the birds, right? But the, right, but the logic of it is also, when would the birds come to eat the dead men? after the war so it actually falls in a sequential order that makes sense but what we know for sure is it had to be at the end of that seventh bowl because that's when the war occurred and that's when the dead bodies would be there right so this again is at the end of the seventh bowl and that's again because the war has occurred after the war correct so that's a parenthesis statement, but it's got to be after the war. Okay. All right. Yes, I get, you know, this is where I had a little trouble. Do I want to count 17 to 21 as one section? Or did I want to note two things? I guess the reason I broke it down is because of this statement of it being called the great supper of God, which by the way, is a contrast to what? The wedding feast that came before, right? So I, I ended up breaking it up, but truly you could probably put the whole thing together, but we're going to go on to 20 to, and it'll take us all the way to 21. Now tell me why you think I might've separated those. What's happening in this segment? Well, because the keys are there, they're still there. There aren't any events. Yes, but tell me what is what other major event is happening there? The beast is being what? The beast is being seized and cast into the lake of fire. That to me is a major event. And yes, you're correct on that. So so if you want to. You can do 17 to 21 as one paragraph if you want, if it makes it easier in your thinking, because it does conclude that the rest were killed with the sword. I think that's distinct, though, and I think it really relates more to the, the punishment of the beast and the false prophet than it really does to the war. And my reason is what happens to them? Are they cast into the lake of fire at this point? No, they are not. What happens then? The birds of the air come and they eat them up, correct? So you're right on that, that that's what happens. But I think the contrast is the outcome of them is they don't go into the lake of fire yet, correct? Mm -hmm. What happens is their bodies are, are eaten up, but what does that tell you about their soul? They're somewhere else, right? We'll be talking about that next. Okay, so here, 19 to 21, then it's the beast and false prophet are seized and cast into lake of fire. Sweet, like birds sitting on a box waiting all over Israel watching assemble yeah. and the whole thing and finally God says okay now yeah now. right and did you notice in verse 20 how they were thrown into the uh, to the lake of fire alive. alive why do you think it says that these the beast and the false prophet which are the antichrist 
and the false prophet, these are men, they're not weird things, they're men, correct? These are two men, right? These two men are cast al alive into the lake of fire. What do you think the inference might be? What is being suggested there? Yeah. Okay. So that torment, that, that it's about torment. Okay. That's concerning that lake of fire, but why would it say alive? So what does that tell you about the souls of men? They're eternal. They live on. When you die and go to this place, hell, this lake of fire, you don't ever die. What does it say? The worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched they're just like our soul in faith we go to be with god the father our our souls are also eternal we are made in the image of god in that way that we have a soul and it's eternal it never dies so you will live in one of two places either in heaven with god because you believe in him or in hell for eternity in this lake of fire which is not going to be a good place to be First of all, simply the absence of God, the absence of the presence of God is going to be enough to make you be in torture. But this is a place of fire. And the intention is that God says that apart from me, there is no peace. Apart from me, there is no happiness. There is no joy. There is no pleasure. There is no light. There is, there is nothing. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting in some of the scriptures, it talks about this fire that burns, but it doesn't give off light. It burns, but it doesn't give off light. There is no light. It's darkness. It's eternal darkness. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if this is, I think it's probably a dumb question, but Yes. Is that a foreshadow of this? Or is that a restatement? Those are really good questions that I'm not sure I'm prepared to answer yet today, but I do have them when we hit the part of chapter 20 here, we're going to talk about that a little bit. I have some paperwork on it, so I'll share with you what I do know. Yes, that's what I'm saying. In part three and part four, we're going to do tons. We're going to do that. See, this is why this is called overview. Even though it doesn't really feel like overview, does it? I know. It's, but you know what's really cool? Honest to goodness, if all you got was what we've done so far in these first two parts, you already, you've got a huge point. What, what we have right now is a tool. In our, in our being of knowledge that we, it's a resource we can now pull from. Now that we know we've got all these segment divisions, we've got these parentheses, we've got these different literary forms, we kind of know where to go to find our timeline pieces. And we're gonna be disciplined to fall back on that, not say, now wait a minute, you're in 14, you're not in, in 16, in 14, you're in a parentheses, you can't timeline it, but in 16 you can, because why? You're bowl one, bowl two, bowl three. If you're in a sequential part, you can timeline it. But if you're in any of those other parts, you have to use the information there, true. You gather it, you make your list, but then you have to go back to a timeline moment and look for where it fits to timeline it. Or you have to go to your cross-referencing that we'll do in part three and part four to get the rest of it. But believe it or not, this is just the beginning. <laughs> okay, so now we're ready to do chapter 20. And we've got 15 minutes, so we're going to have to do it pretty quick. What do we see in chapter 20? We are now in, uh, it's going to be 1 to 15. Is that right? 15? So 20, 1 to, yeah, 1 to 15. Okay, we have... Um, We basically have, th I found three paragraphs. So let's see, because I'm looking at the thens. Then in the verse one, verse four, then, and then verse 11, then. Are you seeing those three? Oh, did I miss one? Then death and Hades. Okay. Okay. So you could break that last part down. I had included that in the great white throne part, but okay. So those are helpful clues and let's just kind of use them as a guide then. Okay, so let's look at 20, 
one to six, that's the first one. What is the major event happening? Oh, sorry, one to three. What did I do on here? Don't correct me. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, one to three, what happens there? Satan is bound. How long? 1,000 years. You're going to see why I had put it before the other way. Okay. And now it's six to um, four, to, mm -hmm. four to six. <laughs> um, yeah. How do I want to do this? We okay. Let me see. I had four to six on here when the thousand years were completed. That is another break. So through seven, yes. So do let's do four to six, which is what I had. I just missed. I didn't count the win, although mine is marked, and I did. Mark, I did break it there. <laughs> okay, let's do four to six. What do we see there? What is the major event that is being described to us in four to six? This really has two aspects to it, but what is the major thing that's going on there? Well, the army, the armies were about given judgment. Armies are given judgment, okay? And they're gonna do what? What are they gonna do? What are we going to do during this thousand years that Satan is bound? We're going to reign with who? Christ. Christ. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what's happening in four to six? Christ is going to reign for 1,000 years. And who's going to reign with him? The bride. The bride. Or, and the saints. It, it actually includes a secondary part, right? Did you notice that? Then I saw thrones and they sat on them. Now, we've talked about this before. That they... If you go, if you back it up, it's the only one it can go back to that qualifies as a ruler with Jesus, because all the rest of the people before that are people who are going to end up in the place of fire, right? The they there is the armies that follow Jesus. And before that, it's the bride who's married to him, right? And I think it's very interesting because if you think about the, when you get married, what did God design Eve to be for Adam, the helpmate. Isn't that interesting? So even when you go back and you look at this bride statement back in the in the worship part, where he says, and the, the marriage has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now I know it's speaking of the, the linens, right? The, the linen that she's putting on, but it's also talking about made herself ready, ready to do what? To be his helpmate, his wife. We come back first as a helpmate, as his armies. The next time we see us, we're going to be his helpmate as what? Rulers. Are you seeing us now having been made ready? We're ready because now we are his, his helpmate. So we come back to rule and reign with him. So the first thing is Jesus Christ rules 1,000 years and... Um, the saints, I'm just going to put it that way. That's kind of my term. Rule with Christ 1,000 years. Correct? Uh, yes, and it's talking about, so, and this is the first resurrection. And I am not going to... Uh, E-C-T-I-O-N. Um, I'm not going to go into that into a lot of detail, but what do you what do you think it's speaking of then? The first resurrection, meaning what? There is obviously another one. Who gets involved in and do you think first means sequentially there's a first, a second, a third, a fourth? Or do you do you think first is more of a title? maybe have there been resurrections before this in history yeah so it's not the first i can tell you just 
there you go. Okay, who is who? Right. Yes. Right. Okay, so there are basically two people groups here, right? Did you see the word and? The first part says, and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I also saw, in other words, and I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded because of their testimony. Who are they? Those are tribulation saints. So who is the first they? The church, who is the bride who's coming with Christ as his armies. So it's going to be the bride and it's going to be the tri tribulation saints, right? So we've got the bride and the trib saints. Right. Yeah, so what it's saying is both the bride and the trib saints, although their resurrection is obviously going to be coming at two different times, right? Because we're going to be out of there somewhere before the seventh bowl. These trib saints can only be resurrected at the end when it's a done deal, if they've died. So there's actually two time frames, but they're both called the first resurrection. I just wanted to point that out to you because that one caught me when I was studying this many years ago and I thought, well, I always thought first, second, third, fourth meant a sequential order. Well, context rules for your interpretation. And here it makes it very clear. The first resurrection is referring to a designation of, of an event. It's actually called the first. It might be like be calling it the greatest or the best or you know, or the glorification, or I mean, I don't know what you want to, how else it could be called, but it'd be cool to do a word study on that and see if it comes out to show us anything more that we maybe in the English it just translated improperly. Maybe. Right. Okay. Now, that's okay. Yeah. And I, and I don't want to leave everybody hanging but we need to go and do some more work on that and let's because i don't have the answers yeah i'm just curious why we generalize this to the entire church and not just oh because the first part it says and they came and sat with him well that that day is talking about the bride that followed him and that bride includes people like you and me even though we're not martyred we go we go back to the bride in uh, 19 uh seven and the word and the conjunction as a matter of fact he restates it i saw that them that uh that sat on them judgment was given to them and i saw these other ones and judgment was given to them so it's two yep you gotta i love those conjunctions if you pay attention and mark them i always circle them and highlight them because they let you know that it's two parts that's why i said one two you know as opposed to just saints in general it's one two <laughs> Uh-huh. Right. And there's a second resurrection. Wait till we get there. To be judged later. And, and who are they? Well, do you remember what I brought up to you a minute ago about the... They were killed, the birds of the air ate them, but what, but they were, there you go. Very good. Okay, so you're already starting to see it. Are, are y'all following what she was saying? That what has going to happen is there's going to be another resurrection, not called the first resurrection, it's called the second death. And that's going to happen with the great white throne, which we're almost there. That's right. Yes. Yes. Isn't that cool? How much this is starting to make sense? I love this. Okay, good. Yes. After, oh, yeah. Right in here. It, yes. As a matter of fact, in the details that are told us, we are seeing there's a sequential order to this, that the first order is that somewhere before uh, before the seventh bowl, because we already know that from the other timelining in chapter 16, 
that 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 war happens in the seventh bowl we know that the second resurrection that's going to follow this first resurrection doesn't happen until after it because it tells us in the details it happens after right yeah at least a thousand yes a thousand years after exactly okay so isn't that that's cool you, you guys are getting really with this fast okay what happens then in verse seven what's the next event Satan is released. So we had him bound up here. Now he is released. And um, does it tell how long? Okay, I was thinking it might, it, it said for a short time, but maybe that was a different reference. Okay, it did that earlier. Okay, so Satan will be released from his prison. He's going to come out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth. Now here comes another one of these statements that are, is very interesting. What is it, um, what, when he's released, what is he released for? Gog and Magog, which is a what? It's a war correct for war it actually says that okay so i don't have to put that in parentheses okay i thought it did say that okay uh yeah i've got it marked war okay so gathered gog and magog to gather them together for the war and then it gives you the detail of how many are going to be there now isn't this shocking to think that Jesus has been ruling and reigning and us with him in righteousness for 1,000 years. At the end of the 1,000 years, those people who have come into this world during that time frame, at the end of 1,000 years, they will still rebel. Who's been bound for that 1,000 years? Satan has been bound. So what does that tell you about during this 1,000 years? The nature of man. Well, what, what do you think they, they well, they were, in heaven, but we're not in heaven yet. We're on the thousand year rail. We're on the earth. Well, what do you think it is? Do you think every single human being on the earth gets killed in that thousand, in that um, Gog and Magog? Do, well, apparently they're not then, are they? Nope. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes. That's who's in charge. Who's going to, so what do we, now, they, they, okay. I'm going to stop you here because I understand your questions. You're going to get this. This is an overview. And when we go to, you're going to get the answer in Daniel. When we do our cross referencing, you're going to pull in additional information where God's going to tell you where those other people are going to be coming from. Okay. Uh, or seven or eight months, maybe six months at the most. I'll be there. Exactly. Right. Well, what I'm saying is we don't have it given to us yet. Now, here's another principle about doing any kind of Bible study. No matter what your subject matter is, whatever the doctrine is you're trying to come to in, uh, conclusions on, you're never going to get all your information in one place. It's going to be splattered all throughout the word of God. So you have to accumulate your information and then layer it together in one big long list. And then you get a better totality of it. And then once you've done that, you still have to timeline and draw pictures and, you know, do all the things that we've been doing in order to try to get the full picture of it. Then you also have to do your research on your historical background to things. What did they think at that time? What is your literary form? I mean, all these things have to be factored in when you're looking. It just and might. And maybe this is where this is all taking place. If that's where the big war is coming, perhaps the people living. Around. Well, we know it's in Israel because it's Gog and it's uh, Harmageddon, which is in Israel, right? Physically, they're part of the war. Just watching from afar. Hmm. What's going on over there? What's we'll see. And and trust me, you're going to get more when we do our cross referencing with Zechariah, with Ezekiel, with Joel, with Matthew, with um 
Daniel is going to be a big one when you get into Daniel. I mean, you sh you probably will remember it. as soon as we go in there and drop in and get those references. You'll go, oh yeah, we studied this. I remember this now. It'll all come back immediately. You'll see it. Okay, so, Saints are la released. Gog and Magog. Now this subject of Gog and Magog, I have paperwork on that I can. I will. I'm sending out the link for you on this so that you can have it on the link. You got. You really want the Gog and Magog stuff too? Oh my gosh. All right. All right. I can give it to you. Hold on. Okay. So Gog and Magog, just in totality, let me just tell you this much. Gog and Magog simply is speaking of nations and peoples of the earth who come up against God. There have been a variety of them throughout generations. We see it mentioned in Ezekiel. We see it in first Chronicles. I think it is. Um, there was a passage, let me just read this one verse to you. Now, this one does not mention Gog and Magog, but it describes the issue very clearly. This is in Psalm 83, and it says this, um, keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies make atonement, and they hate thee, and have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. That's interesting, thy hidden ones, because we're going to talk about those who will, who will flee to the wilderness to hide. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. How many, of you, how many times have we heard on the news, death to Israel, death to America for that matter, but death to Israel. They want to push them into the sea. This is what this is speaking of. They want to cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may no longer be remembered that they have cons and they have consulted together with one consult and they are a confederate against thee. That in totality really explains what Gog and Magog is making reference. We do know there is a literal geographical place of Gog and Magog. We also know it was an ancestor in Genesis 10. It talks about one of them being the son of um, Japheth, I think it was. Sham, Ham, and Japheth came off the ark with Noah. Those three sons repopulated our earth. That tells you it only takes three couples. To, just telling you, <laughs> three couples and they repopulated this whole earth. And sometimes a thousand years, a thousand years would do it. <laughs> and uh, well, anyway, okay, yeah. And so what I'm saying is now there are pictures and maps on these that'll show you basically possibilities of areas. There's been all kinds of speculation, but just keep in mind, even the guy who came up with this, what he's doing is taking ancient records, what little bit we have in scriptures about it, and he's drawing a conclusion. I think he's very accurate, but some people want to specifically say, oh, it's Russia. Well, it might be, but then again, it may not be. It may be others. All, they have, all we know in the text of things, I think, is it says they come from the north, but I'm not positive even on that. So just keep all that in mind. Gog and Magog is, I think, generically is all we really need to understand. They are enemies of God. Here at this point, they come up against God after the thousand year reign. And what's interesting to me is um, they call it a war, but how does it end? Fire. Just like that, fire comes down to heaven and consumes them. Okay, then we have one more event, and that's in 2011 to 15. Yes. Oh, sorry. The earth flings away. There oh, uh, yes, that's where we're at. Okay, so the first one, it says, uh, well, it could be, the first one actually was the throne. It says the great white throne judgment. And the earth fled away. And what does that mean, right? Oh, earth and heaven and heaven okay well if earth and heaven are going to flee away what does that what does that tell you is coming next on the scene the new heaven and the new earth right which we aren't there yet but we're going to see that next week correct in 21 it comes on very suddenly what's really fun about this part of this this segment is this is talking about the judgment of who 
Who's being judged at this throne judgment? All the unbelievers. And it calls them by a title. What are they called? The dead. Now, this is very interesting. There is doctrine on this in scripture that says that we are dead in Christ, that we are dead apart from Christ. In Adam, we are dead. That's, that's the state, that's called the federal headship law. That's out of Romans chapter five. You start out dead. You are born dead. Uh, David spoke of this, you know, that he, that he's, he, he was born and conceived in sin. <clears throat> it's the sin doctrine. So the rest of the dead, these are people who had not come into faith then, did not come alive until the thousand years were completed. So where are we on a timeline? Well, it's, it has to be after this thousand years, right? And this war occurs. And then happens this throne judgment. And, and then it says, the dead rest in peace, right? These are the dead. There's my grass. Yeah, but they don't rest, just resting. You're right about that. They really don't rest in peace at all. But the dead are going to be judged. Okay. Um, Oh, I wish I had time and I don't. We're, gone. We're past our time. Um, you can go to Luke 16 and look at the passage that talks about this place called uh, the abode of the dead or the bosom of Abraham and the paradise. I would love to teach on that. For those of you who've never had that teaching before, you've already had the experience of doing this. Go and draw pictures of it. Draw it out in visual form for yourself we did do it in part, part one you did it i okay so oh, okay never mind this so we're done okay good i i didn't know i did that i know i didn't really teach the whole thing though fully i i did a quickie on it because there's a great if you actually spend a whole one week lesson just studying that doing your word studies on what those words all meet in that passage draw out that picture write out the steps of what happens and then do a timeline putting Christ on the cross and follow it all the way through. It's, it's amazing study, really. Um, so the great white throne, what happens there? The dead are judged. And what happens to those that are, call, that are called the dead? What's the end result for them? Yes, they're judged on their deeds. And where are they thrown? Into the lake of fire, right? Thrown, and then they go into the lake of fire. Okay, there we go. They call it the second death. So they're the dead. Now they're going to a second death, right? They've been judged by God at this great white throne judgment. This is where those books are opened. We also don't have time to talk about our books, but the books are great. Uh, there's a couple of kinds of books that you needed to be familiar with, understanding of that. Maybe when we get back from Christmas, we'll have a chance to go back and work on that a little bit more, I hope. Oh, yeah, you know, that's really cool. No, and death and Hades are very interesting because it says on here, the way this happens, it says the sea gave up the dead. Now, what is the sea symbolically representing? The earth or the nations. It's the earth and all the nations that live on the earth, right? We've seen this even in Daniel talked about the sea and up out of the sea came this kingdom out, of, right? So here it's the sea. So the earth gave up the dead. Now, how does the earth give up its dead? And what happens to them when the earth gives them up? Where do they go? Great white throne judgment for their judgment. And then they're cast into, right? So how does the earth, um, it says, uh, let's see. Where does it say about the earth? Which verse? First one. Um, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. There's lots of great cross references on that. Um, Second Peter 3, 10 to 13. Does anybody remember in Second Peter uh, what it says about how earth is destroyed? She's not going to be destroyed by water because we were promised this time by fire. Where do you think that fire is? 
Yeah, maybe the lake of fire, because in this case, it says it, it fled away, but we know that it's going to be consumed by fire. And it says that the dead gave up its, its dead. And you and I have talked about, well, then where are the dead souls right now today? They're in the what? Belly of the earth. So the earth gives up her dead to the throne. And how does it give it up? because it's consumed by fire. So what is, and if death and Hades have been thrown into the lake of fire, what do you think just got thrown into the lake of fire? The earth. Why? Because all things that are corruptible will be destroyed at this point. We get a new heaven and a new earth in the next chapter. It's very exciting. Because so what it's literally saying is the earth itself is this death in Hades that's being spoken of. Why? Because it's it's the uh, it has received the consequence of the sin of man. It is the place of corruption. It's where the body goes to corrupt in the earth and to right and to, to decay. So the dead are, are people in God's orphanage. Yes, yes, Everybody. yes. From beginning of time, all starting with Cain on, they're not happy. Look at Luke 16, and it's is it 16. Um, is that what I said? Luke 16. Yeah, go in and look at Luke 16 because it tells you what what they're doing. Jesus tells us that it's Jesus that gives us that account, by the way. So it's a very accurate account. Begging for water, just a drop of water on my tongue. All right, thank you guys. I'm sorry we did we ran out of time, but it was good. A great story. Okay, here's my goggles.